So we are in the book of Romans. If you need a Bible, we've got those available. Uh, Romans 15, uh, verses 14 to 33. So we've been rolling through Romans. And I asked Steve, I was like, when did you guys start? Because I know it was before I got here. And he's like, well, back in January is when we started the book of Romans. And we are getting towards the end of this letter. Um, We're in Romans 15, verses 14 to 33. Next week, Steve will be back. And I think over the next two weeks, he's gonna kind of recap and kind of wrap up uh, this Roman series. And um, it's, it's pretty fun to think about uh, what Paul is, has been communicating and how he's closing out this letter. And, Paul, and Paul's writing this letter <clears throat> to the church in Rome. And it's a group of people that he had not actually met, but he was hoping to spend time with. He, he's closing out this letter He's ending it and he's reaffirming how he started the letter with a personal touch and encouraging words. And and Paul's making some final comments. He's sharing about his purposes and his plans and his need for prayer. And before we get into 15, 14 to 33, just to kind of get some perspective, way back at the beginning of Romans, when he starts this letter in Romans 1, he just makes a great greeting. He says, "To to all of those in Rome, who are loved by God and called to be saints. Grace to you and peace from God, our Father and Lord Jesus Christ. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you because your faith is proclaimed in all the world. For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his son, that without ceasing, I mention you always in my prayers, asking that somehow God's will By God's will, I may now at last succeed in coming to you. For I long to see you, that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to strengthen you. That is, that we may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith, both yours and mine. So that's the beginning of the letter. And then when you get into the end of this letter, as he's wrapping this up, Paul begins this section in Romans 15, starting at verse 14, with a word of commendation to this church. And he moves from doctrine and practical Christian living and shifts to more personal matters regarding his heart and his desires and and what he's been doing, what he's been up to, and what his hopes are for the future. And Paul knew about the reputation of the body of believers. So let's take a listen. It's going to be a little long, but I'm going to read this. The the title at the beginning of this section is Paul, the minister to the Gentiles. And Paul writes this, I myself am satisfied about you, my brothers, that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge and able to instruct one another. But on some points, I've written to you very boldly by way of reminder because of the grace given me by God to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles in the priestly service of the gospel of God so that the offering of the Gentiles may be acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In Christ Jesus, then, I have reason to be proud of my work for God, for I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me to bring the Gentiles to obedience by word and deed, by the power of signs and wonders, by the power of the Spirit of God. So that from Jerusalem and all the way around Illyricum, I have fulfilled the ministry of the gospel of Christ. And thus I make it my ambition to preach the gospel, not where Christ has already been named, lest I build on someone else's foundation, but as it is written, those who have not, who have never been told of him will see, and those who have never heard will understand. This is the reason why I have so often been hindered from coming to you. But now, since I no longer have any room for work in these regions, and since I have longed for many years to come to you, I hope to see you in passing as I go to Spain and to be helped on my journey there by you once I have enjoyed your company for a while. At present, however, I'm going to Jerusalem bringing aid to the saints for Macedonia and Achaia have been pleased to make some contributions for the poor among the saints at Jerusalem, for they were pleased to do it. And indeed, they owe it to them. For if the Gentiles have come to share in their spiritual blessings, they ought also to be of service to them in material blessings. When therefore I have completed this and have delivered to them what has been collected, I will leave for Spain by way of you. I know that when I come to you, I will come in the fullness of the blessing of Christ." 
I appeal to you, brothers, by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit, to strive together with me in your prayers to God on my behalf, that I may be delivered from the unbelievers in Judea and that my service for Jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints so that by God's will, I may come to you with joy and be refreshed in your company. May the God of peace be with you all. Amen. It's a lot that, that Paul has to share. But what's interesting is, is as Paul is communicating and as he's wrapping up this letter, he moves to these kind of personal greetings and connections and information. And he's, he's commending this body of believers who he hadn't met, but that he knew about. And he uses some really interesting words right there at verse 14. He, he says that they're full of goodness. They're full of knowledge. They're, they have the ability to teach and instruct each other. Paul affirms them and commends them for who they are and how they represent themselves well as followers of Jesus. It's really interesting to think about as he uses these words full of goodness and full of knowledge and full of the ability to instruct one another. It makes me think, you know, what are, what are we full of? You know, what kinds of things fill us up? There's times um, when I'm interacting with my wife, Paula, and uh, maybe I'm getting a little annoying or I'm getting a little snarky or I'm just being a pest or I'm just like kind of trying to like push a button and she'll say, you're just kind of full of it. And we don't necessarily say what it is, but she's like, you're full of it. And I'm like, well, yeah, I'm full of it. I am full of it. And I was thinking, you know, as Paul is writing, it just makes me think about this church in Rome that's full of goodness and knowledge and the ability to instruct. And it makes me think, man, what are, what are the things we're full of? Are we full of love? And are we full of joy? And are we full of peace? And other times we struggle because we're full of anger or we're full of strife or we're full of envy or, or whatever the case may be. And so Paul gives them this commendation. He says, you are full of these things. However, after the encouragement, he brings out a word that's, that's fairly significant. It's the word, but. He says, uh, you know, here's the deal. You're full of this. You're doing that. You're doing great. But there are some things that I needed to boldly communicate and share with you as way of reminder to help you understand what matters what is valuable, and where growth is needed. And when, when we read scripture, there's times when the word but is used and it should get our attention because it grabs us and, and, and makes a transitional moment. And Paul's saying, these are the things you're, you're doing well at, but here's some things you need to work on. Um, there's some great times where the apostle Paul uses the word but in, in Romans 5, 8, but God demonstrates his love for us, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. There's some moments where we can read about the significance. And whenever that word is used, it's like, hey, what is he talking about? What's the shift? It's like, if you've ever heard, um, if you read therefore in the Bible, right? You gotta say like, oh, what's well, therefore, therefore? You know, you gotta kind of refer back and get some perspective on what the context is. And so as Paul is talking, he's saying, man, you're doing some really good things. And he encourages them and he reiterates, there's, there's some things you need to keep working on. There's some things you need to be aware of. There's some things you need to learn. And Paul, even though he hasn't met them personally, he has place and he has position to speak into their lives and to guide them in their journey as a church. He, he wants them to understand his heart and his purpose, the purpose that God has called him to fulfill and help them realize that they are a part of that mission and that purpose, and that calling. He clearly shares from a place of passion, and he's trying to give his readers some perspective. Paul has experienced the grace of God, which is astounding, and he's been called by God to minister to and meet the needs of people who are not of Jewish descent, Gentiles. He's a missionary to the Gentiles. His testimony and, and his life and, 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 and who he is is representing what God has called him to. And, and Paul's reminding the people about who he is. I mean, God clearly placed a specific plan and calling on Paul's life. If you were to look at Acts 9, 15, God is speaking. He says, I'm going to use Paul as my chosen instrument 
to the Gentiles. Paul is reminding them about who he is and what he's doing and how God is using him through the power of the Holy Spirit. If you were to go back and look at uh, verses 16 to 19, I'm gonna read these. He, he just kind of talks about what this looks like and, and, and what his focus is. Listen to what he shares in verses 16 to 19. I'm actually gonna start with verse 15. It says, but on some points, I've written to you very boldly by way of reminder, because of the grace given me by God to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles in the priestly service of the gospel of God, so, so that the offering of the Gentiles may be acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In Christ Jesus, then, I have reason to be proud of my work for God, for I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me to bring the Gentiles to obedience by word and deed, by the power of signs and wonders, by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and all the way around Illyricum, I have fulfilled the ministry of the gospel of Christ. God has been using Paul. God gets all the glory. Paul has labored, he has toiled, he has traveled, he has suffered, and the gospel message has been planted in a very large regional area. Paul has done the work. He's fulfilling this specific part of his calling and he's giving the glory to God and realizing that it's through the power of the Holy Spirit. And, and he restates his ambition. His ambition, his goal, his purpose is to preach the gospel in places where people have not heard. I mean, he quotes from Isaiah 52, verse 15. Those who have never been told of him will see. And those who have never heard will understand. I mean, he's utilizing this verse almost as a life verse, as a way to say, this is what it's about. This is who I am. With a desire to bring the good news to places that have not yet had or heard the truth of Jesus revealed to them. He, he doesn't wanna build on already established work that's familiar. He wants to provide new insight to people who don't know and need to be exposed to the message of Jesus. In verses 14 to 21 is all about Paul's purpose to go and do and serve and preach and impact people that do not know who he is. Not who Paul is, do not know who Jesus is. And Paul, in his, in his late 50s, he, he isn't slowing down He's not setting up shop. He's not settling in or feeling satisfied in what he's accomplished. He clearly reveals the necessity to continue living out the call of God on his life. And after reading these eight verses of this, of this section, it challenges me. I think it should challenge us to ask some questions. What is God calling me to? What is the point? What is the purpose what are my priorities? What is God calling me to do? And how am I answering his call on my life? I mean, these are questions we should all be asking in whatever situation, in whatever circumstance, whatever age range, whatever life stage, whatever occupation, or, or whatever we're dealing with, we need to be looking for the ministry moments and asking God, use me. I'm available Give me opportunities to do for you what you have called me to do because of what you have done for me. Now, now here's the thing. Um, this can be challenging for a lot of different reasons. I mean, there, there's times when, um, when we might feel unable. There's times when we might feel incapable or unqualified or discouraged. We just might be full of doubt. Um, we might be unmotivated. We, we might have some moments of, of insecurity or just plain unwilling. I mean, just honestly, like, I just don't want to. God, you may be calling me. You may have a purpose. You may have a plan, whatever, but I'm just not, I'm not feeling it. But here's the thing. When we change our attitude and we ask the Lord to give us insight, then even the smallest things can have major 
impact. Um, I read a little devotional on a regular basis. It, usually there's a little story that's tied to a verse and it gives me a chance to kind of read and put the two together and then spend some time in prayer. And I was reading some different, devo- different uh, passages and some different devotionals that were kind of coming across my screen. And, and I read this and I thought it kind of applied to what we're talking about here. There's a, an older gentleman, his name is Harold. I don't know Harold. I don't know anything about Harold, but Harold shared, shared his heart. And Harold said, I, I felt so useless. He continued talking. He says, I'm widowed. I'm retired. My adult children are busy with their own families. I'm spending quiet afternoons in my living room watching shadows on the wall. And he would often tell his daughter, I'm old. I've lived a full life. I have no purpose anymore. God can take me at any time. And one afternoon, however, a conversation changed Harold's perspective, changed his mind, changed his attitude. He said, my neighbor had some problems with his kids. So I prayed for him. And later I had an opportunity to share the gospel with him. That's how I realized I still have purpose. And then Harold says this, as long as there are people who haven't heard of Jesus, I must tell them about the Savior. And when Harold responded to an everyday, ordinary encounter by sharing his faith, his neighbor's life was changed. And that's <clears throat> that's powerful. Harold realized that he still had purpose to be used by God in his situation and circumstance and life stage. And he wasn't gonna allow things to prevent him from being used by God to share the good news of the gospel. God was calling him to be a difference maker for the kingdom. Now, what's interesting is as Paul is writing this, at one point, he he uses this word picture, this metaphor. He He uses the term priestly service. Now, Paul was not claiming to be a priest. We have one high priest, that's Jesus. We have one mediator, that's Jesus. Um, We do not need a priest to have access. Jesus is our advocate. He's the one who goes before us. He's the one who represents us. But here's the thing. Paul uses this metaphor to say, hey, I've been placed in a position that the purpose and the call of God in my life is to represent and to present and to minister to and to meet the needs of people who haven't heard about Jesus. And you know what? That's true for you and me. Second Peter chapter two, verse nine, Peter says, we're a royal priesthood. We're a chosen nation. We're to be used by God to share the good news to those and to represent the God of the universe to those who don't know. In in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul writes about being ministers of reconciliation, that the love of Christ compels us. and, and, And we're called to be ministers who represent what reconciliation looks like, to be ambassadors for God to a world that needs to know that reconciliation is possible because of Jesus Christ and who he is and what he's done and the relations that we have with him and the relationship we wanna share with those around us. And that's what Paul is trying to communicate It's what he's doing. He's fulfilling his purpose. He's reminding the Roman church of who he is, what he's doing, how God is using him, and what his life is all about because of who Jesus is in his life. It's all about Jesus. And Paul had purpose. And and Paul is communicating this to the Romans, and he's really challenging his readers. He's challenging us today. What's your purpose? How is God using you? And what is God calling you to do? Then as you kind of continue reading in verses 22 to 29, Paul backs this up by communicating his plans and his heart for where he wants to go, what he wants to do, and how he's going to do it. He wants to meet with the church in Rome, but the work of spreading the gospel has kept him from getting to them. There's lots of things going on. He wants to be with them, but he's, he's continuing to do the work. He's completed the initial work of sharing about Jesus. He's planted seeds. He's partnered with others who can carry on sharing the, the message in the areas where he has been. And now he desires to carry on the great commission to Spain. At that time, Spain was the known ends of the earth. 
What does the Great Commission call us to do? To share the good news of the gospel to the ends of the earth. And Paul's saying, I want to get to Spain. I want to visit you. I'm, I'm going to go to Jerusalem. I, eventually, I'm going to get to Spain, but I want to continue pushing out this Great Commission and sharing the good news of the gospel to those who haven't heard, who need to hear. And at the time, the, the message was for more people to hear and to get to know the good news of Jesus. <clears throat> but he's got a task that he needs to complete along the way, delivering encouragement to the believers in Jerusalem from Gentile believers who've brought up a collection and who are providing for the needs of those in Jerusalem. Paul's been given the responsibility. He's been entrusted to bring financial provision to people in need. It's an important task. It's a part of God's plan that maybe wasn't initially a part of Paul's plan, but Paul understands the value of living within the plans and the purposes of Jesus. Here's the deal. Our plans need to be lined up with God's plans. And when God's plans change, we need to be in lockstep with him. Proverbs 16.9 says, that, you know, we make the plans, but here's the deal. The Lord directs our steps. God directs our steps. God was directing the steps of Paul. Paul had plans. He was making sure that those plans lined up with what God wanted. And when we plan and prepare, we need to hold them loosely and be ready for things to shift and to change. And we need to be willing to flex because God's ways, God's plans are bigger and better than our ways and our plans. When God redirects, we need to make sure the, the plans that we have created are foundationally in line with the plans of the one we are called to follow. Now, when we talk about plans, there's different passages in God's word that talk about the, the plans of the Lord and, and you know, commit your ways to the Lord. Well, there, there's a passage, there's a verse, Jeremiah 29, 11, that's very familiar for a lot of people. You know, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to give you a future and a hope, plans to prosper you, not to harm you. Well, what's interesting is, you know, that becomes a bumper sticker and a t-shirt and a poster and it's like plaque and you, know, you put it in your wall and you're like, God has plans for me. Yes, he does. That was in Jeremiah's time, spoken through the prophet Jeremiah to the people of Israel who were in exile for a specific time and a specific season. So we have to be careful not to take a, a passage or a verse out of context and be like, I'm claiming it for me because this is what's gonna happen and I'm gonna have future and hope and, and you know, I'm gonna rub the lamp and God's gonna do because he has plans for me. Well, here's the thing. The principle we can gather from Jeremiah 29, 11 is this. God knows and God has plans. And are we willing to follow and be guided and directed by the one who knows the plan? Because God knows, for I know the plans I have for you. Yes, the principle is this. God's plans are better and greater than my plans or your plans. So, so Paul tells the church in Rome, here's the plan. I had a plan that I had planned, but here's what's happening. And eventually I'm gonna get to you. And we're gonna spend time in fellowship and, and we're gonna encourage one another and, and it's gonna be amazing and, 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 and we're gonna be with one another, hopefully. And I'm gonna get to you eventually, but I gotta go to Jerusalem on my way and then I'm gonna stop and hang out with you and then get to Spain. But here's the deal, Paul was saying this, I'm gonna keep carrying out my purpose and my passion for people who don't know Jesus. Paul gives us a great example to follow. He lived in obedience. He followed faithfully and made himself available to match up his plans in ultimate agreement with what God had in store for him. And even though the plans changed and shifted, it was all within the context of bringing glory to God. And the question is this, are we willing to release our plans to shift our plans to be open to detours and reroutes and redirection from our heavenly father. And most importantly, the leading of the Holy Spirit that empowers us because if we put our faith in Jesus, we have the empowerment and the leading of the Holy Spirit. It's convicting, it's stressful. It can be disappointing, but in the big picture and scenario, it is worth it and satisfying because we're open and we're obedient to what God wants and what he's going to carry about and fulfill in our lives. And we just have to have the right perspective and, 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 and take things in stride. There's a, a guy named Steve Saint and Steve's 
father, back in 1956, when Steve was five, his father was a missionary to Ecuador. Steve's father's name was Nate Saint. And Nate Saint was a missionary pilot. And along with four other men, they went to Ecuador and those men were killed by the Wadani tribe as they were trying to reach these folks with the good news of the gospel. And as a result of the love and forgiveness demonstrated by the families of the martyred men, there is now a growing community of believers among the Wadani. And as an adult, Steve moved back to Ecuador and he became friends with Minkai, one of the men who had killed his father. Steve Saint's motto is this, let God write your story. He says, you have a lot of people who wanna write their own story and then have God be their editor when it goes wrong. Steve says, I decided long ago to let God write my story. And when Steve suffered a serious accident in 2012, he reassured his family, let's let God write this chapter too. And Steve's faith is continuing to carry him on as he goes through recovery from this accident. So devotional goes on to say, the story continues to unfold for all followers of Jesus. None of us knows how the next chapter of our life will read. But as we look to Jesus and run with endurance, the race that is set before us, we can trust the author and the finisher of our faith, Jesus, who writes the beginning of our story and he'll write the next chapter and the ending as well. You know, things happen. Plans change. The unexpected comes into life. I mean, I'm, I'm standing up here and I'm unplanned. I'm like, what? Well, back in 1970, my mom had her own way, had her own plan, had her own desires, had her own whatever, and found herself in Louisiana. <laughs> unplanned. Called her parents. Hey, I need to move home. I'm going to have a baby. Um, I've lived lots of my life thinking, mistake, shouldn't be here, unplanned, unexpected. You know what? That's a load of hooey because God knows the plans. God has a plan. In whatever situation, whatever circumstance, whatever thing that we're dealing with, God's got a bigger picture. God's got a bigger plan. Not unplanned. God knows what's going on. And here's the deal. We just got a few more minutes, but, but as Paul is wrapping up this section in, in verses 30 to 33, Paul brings it all home by focusing and asking for his need for people to be praying for him. See, Paul knows his purpose and he's communicated and established a plan that he's trying to make sure is in line with God's plan. And he realizes that he needs prayer partners to come alongside him, to lift him up and to strive with him for all these things. Provision, protection, presence, peace, and power to accomplish what God has called him to do and what God has called him to be. And Paul makes an appeal. He asks for the men and women in Rome to strive together. The word there is agonize over him in prayer. I mean, here's the thing. The value of prayer in connection to purpose and plan is primary in the work God has for us and what God has called us to do and, and where God has placed us. And Paul realizes how important it'll be to have people praying for him. He lists it in verse 32. He says, so that by God's will, I may come to you with joy and experience refreshment in the midst of community. Paul is saying, pray for me so that God's will comprehensively will be accomplished. So as we think about purpose and as we think about plans, it has to be enveloped in specific, intentional, spirit-led times of partnered prayer, praying for God's way and praying for God's will and praying for God's people and praying for God's plan and for God's purpose. We have to be partnered in prayer, striving together and agonizing over what God is calling us to do, who God is calling us to be, where God is, is leading us to be used by him. Paul reminds the church in Rome about things that are really important, and he presents himself in a way that hopefully inspired them to consider who they are in Christ and what they could or should be 
passionate about as followers of Jesus. I think the same reminders could be for us to consider in, in our cultural context and, and in the time that we are in in history right now. I mean, what is our focus? What is our priority? Where are we investing our time, energy, and effort? And what are we passionate about because of Jesus in our lives? The love of Christ compels us. What are we passionate about because of Jesus in our lives? God wants to use you. God wants to use me. God wants to use us. And God wants us to be significant in our community, both locally and globally, for his kingdom. And God wants us to discover our purpose. And God wants to figure out our plans that match with his plans and our passions without hesitation or regret. We need to be forward thinking. We need to be evangelistic. We need to be relationally invested, purposeful, planned, and prayed up followers of Jesus who throw off some caution to the wind and look for ways to reach others in areas and ways that seem unreachable, but are possible because we serve a God of unlimited possibility. And oftentimes we hesitate, oftentimes we wait, oftentimes we hold on, but really what we need to do is think through, what am I gonna throw off? What am I gonna put away? What distractions do I need to get rid of so I can move forward and, and respond to the call of God wanting to use me and the life that he's given me? Uh, there's an author from the 1800s, Mark Twain. Some of you know, some of you don't. Maybe you've heard, I don't know. Huckleberry Finn, Tom Sawyer, Mark Twain, humorist. He wrote this. 20 years from now, you will be more disappointed by the things that you didn't do than by the ones you did do. So throw off the bow, bow lines, sail away from the safe harbor, catch the trade winds in your sails, explore, dream, and discover. This quote appears on a website intended, intended to help people discover what they're passionate about so they can live with greater significance. And the apostle Paul's passion in life was largely driven by concerns for the eternal destiny of others. He names three things that fueled his passion. First, he recognized he was accountable to Jesus for his service and wanted to give a good accounting at the judgment seat of Christ. Second, Paul was driven by the love of Jesus and a desire that others would know the love that he'd experienced. In verse 14 of 2 Corinthians 5, he wrote, for the love of Christ compels us. And finally, Paul understood that a lost and dying world needs the Savior. Here's the question, what are you passionate about? Paul's passion for people was fueled by the love of Christ and ours should be as well. Let's apply Mark Twain's words to our efforts and outreach. Sail away from the safe harbor, share the love of Christ with someone today, amen?